Great. Um, yeah, Rachel and Kirsten, if you'd like to come join. So thank you for bearing with us after that slightly unstable start. Um, welcome to the final official session of Cash Week 2019, um, especially for this session. Um, hopefully, last but not least, um, in this session we're going to be looking at in this session we're going to be looking at uh, how cash and voucher assistance is portrayed in the media and some of the opportunities and risks associated with that. So a little bit of background before we kick off. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Tegan Rogers. I'm the communications manager at the Cash Learning Partnership. And the reason why I wanted to explore this topic at Cash Week um, is for the same reasons that I was attracted to this role at CALP. Um, and that's because cash and voucher assistance is doing something different. Um, it's redressing the power imbalance between the giver and the receiver. It's forcing our very change resistant organizations to be much more accountable and transparent. And it's forcing us to ask some uncomfortable questions about the way that we work. Um, and most importantly, it's helping people rebuild their lives in a way that they choose. So from a communications point of view, that's a very powerful message and one that I'm sure resonates with many people in this room and online. Um, but as I'm sure you're all aware, there is a huge disconnect, not only between our aspirations and the realities of what it's actually like to work in cash and voucher assistance or in a humanitarian organization, juggling multiple priorities, uh, negotiating. In but there's also a disconnect between what it is that we actually do and what it is that the general public out there thinks that we do or believes that we do. And it goes without saying that this conversation is taking place against a backdrop of increasing scrutiny from the media. And rightly so, it is the role of the media to hold powerful institutions to account. But I'd like to have a show of hands. How many people here think that the media has perhaps sometimes unfairly characterized the humanitarian sector? <laughs> I was reading uh, the risk barometer, which is a survey published by Ecclesiastical, um, looking at opinions of 200 leaders of NGOs and charities in the UK and the finding this year was that they felt that the biggest threat to their organization in the next five years was reputational risk and we've spoken a lot this week about risks associated with CVA we know that the humanitarian sector as a whole faces some unprecedented challenges in the future and of course cash and voucher assistance in itself carries its own reputational risks but the sorts of negative narratives that keep recurring around cash and voucher assistance, sorry, around humanitarian aid. Um, we, we know that the, the negative narratives that keep recurring around cash and voucher assistance, sorry, these ideas that cash is more prone to misappropriation or fraud, or that it's wasted or spent frivolously by recipients, these aren't issues that are actually true of cash itself. These are issues that point to more systemic biases and flaws within the humanitarian sector as a whole. So it seems to me that if we want people to stop thinking of humanitarian aid in general as wasteful or paternalistic, then not only do we ourselves need to get serious about this core message behind cash and voucher assistance, this idea of shifting control, power, and choice, but we also need to bring on board the rest of the world with us too. And so to help us explore this issue today, I'm delighted to introduce my panel. So um, to the far right, we have Kirsten Walkham, and Kirsten is the Executive Vice President at Smith & Company. Um, she's worked with some of the world's most established brands, UN organizations, NGOs, governments, Fortune 500 corporations, heads of state and members of the royal family. And she was named the 2018 Global PR Professional of the Year, among other high profile awards. 
And then online, we do have Ben Parker, who is the senior editor at the independent news service, The New Humanitarian. Ben co-founded IRIN, as it was formerly known, in 1995, and he has more than 20 years of experience working in humanitarian affairs, online media, and, and in fragile states, including roles as the director of communications for the UN in Mogadishu and leading OCHA in Damascus and Nairobi. And then next to me, I have Rachel Waddell, who is the partnerships director for, for Europe for Give Directly. And Rachel has previously worked at the Overseas Development Institute, where she was the head of strategic partnerships for governance and climate change. And she's also worked on climate change and sustainable development with the new climate economy, the Global Green Growth Institute, and the UK Department of Energy and Climate Change. So thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, and first of all, I'd like to hand over to Kirsten, who I'm hoping can set the scene for us a little bit. Um, in your work with these sorts of organizations, with humanitarian organizations, um, and outside looking at reputational risk more broadly. So over to you. Excellent, thank you. Can you all hear me? Perfect, great. So thank you, Tegan, very much for having me here. Um, I'm really pleased to be talking on the subject. Actually, prior to joining Smith & Company, I was the Global Communications Director for Save the Children International. So I've had the opportunity to work within the sector and with the sector from a client perspective, which has given me kind of a really good external and internal view to the challenges you're facing. So Tegan is very right that over the past five years, there has been an increasing number of scrutiny and criticism on the charity sector as a whole. This looks at whether it is, we're known for being kind of Luddites or we lack innovation. We're known for, we've been scrutinized on our conduct, maybe for lack of impact. There's been discussions around how we use our money, the fat cat charity. You've all heard them. Some of them are right. Uh, some of them probably were unfair, right? The problem is those headlines change the way the public see us. And increasingly, the public, whether that is a donor, a regulator, your general public, your mum, is looking for greater impact and greater accountability from the, from the sector as a whole. Unfortunately, we haven't always delivered on that. What has been known for the sector is over the past two years, it hasn't necessarily been as easy as it once was. And what we mean by that is we have seen that the sector has been operating under what is called a perception gap. A perception gap really looks at how trusted you think you are and then how trusted you actually are by the public. Everything that's in the middle really opens you up for increased vulnerable vulnerabilities and scrutiny from the general public. It also makes it incredibly difficult for you to improve or protect your reputation. An organization, I'm going to actually jump out of the sector and look at Facebook as a good example, an organization that believes its behaviors or its products or its services are more trusted or more important than the public think they are, really means that the way they respond to issues around privacy, issues around use of money, whatever the problem may be, is disconnected and therefore affects, further affects how trusted and how their brand is seen and listened to and respected and the, the whole kind of, your whole portfolio that makes forward for reputation. Cash transfer is very unique within this discussion. So Tegan and I have talked about it actually quite a lot and she's really hit on some of the really important points as we open, but it has it is such a unique offering for transforming the way traditional aid. It's a unique response to how to the discussion around whether we are or are not innovative, but yet it's it itself comes with an inherent number of risks reputationally. Unfortunately, there are a lot of anti-aid campaigners who would say that if you, we give cash, they're going to use it inappropriately, that it's more vulnerable to financial mismanagement. There are a number of high risks and challenges that are being pushed forward when we talk about cash, but it's also because the public doesn't understand it. They don't understand what you're trying to do with it. They don't understand how it actually empowers communities, despite the substantive research that really looks at how, once we give people cash, 
they are more likely and more motivated to make sustainable and long-term change. We all know that that's what we're trying to strive for, but we need to tell that story in a more captivating and engaging manner that will actually enhance and Im improve the reputation and the trust of CVA, but also it will help to narrow that perception gap between the public and us so that when and if there is a risk with problems do happen, right? In the aid sector, it's a very complex sector. It's very complex issues and situations in countries that we work in. We need to prepare ourselves for those risks and reducing that gap will make a big, big impact towards it. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to Ben next, who is online. Um, and I'm gonna ask Ben to share with us his perspectives as a journalist um, covering some of these sorts of issues. Um, ben, what do you see, or how do you see the recent scale-up of cash and voucher assistance intersecting with this increased scrutiny on the humanitarian sector that we've just been talking about? Thanks for that. I'm glad to join you. Yeah, it is the graveyard shift and you're all desperate to get to the pub. Um, we'll make the most of the afternoon slot. Um, I had, a, I had a friend once who worked in this um, sector and he said, you know, what is this um, cash for work idea? And he was like, what's, what does that mean? It's like, isn't that a job? And I, I, I do think um, there is a problem that we'll come back to, I'm sure, which is you're overcomplicating things a little bit. And um, there's a tendency in the sector and in any perhaps specialised field of human endeavour to go um, a little bit uh, crazy with your own bump, inside your own bump. Anyway, we'll come back to that. Uh, I'm not sure I agree there's greater scrutiny. I think there's greater criticism and there's a, a, a problem with trust and public confidence um, due to some very high profile catastrophes like the um, sex abuse scandals um, known as the Oxfam scandal, somewhat unfairly. Um, there is, a, yes, a, um, a spirited um, negative campaign from Daily Mail and other British newspapers, but um, the other surveys have, have indicated that it hasn't actually had much influence, certainly on the British public's um, uh, confidence in the principles of, um, you know, uh, battling poverty and international um, aid. So both um, domestic surveys and the Eurobarometer say there is some, there is a, a quite a resilient public um, support for this for this sector. What what I think is um, is going on in, and that intersects with with I'm going to talk about three things in, in the in the sector that I think are influential in your media experience and and perhaps three things that you might want to avoid. So. I think there is a problem with the humanitarian sector and development sector is that it isn't a specialist um, journalistic piece around it. So if you're in finance or sports or tennis or frankly pretty much anything, you're likely to get a more qualified um, news reporter on your story than you would uh, if you're in an international um, development. And the BBC abolished the position not so long ago and uh, there are very few media outlets we count ourselves as quite lonely in the space, very few media outlets that specialize in this thing and can distinguish um, bullshit from reality. So it's an unhealthy environment. There isn't an advertising market either to support um, news because uh, most of the business is done on, on tenders. So advertising isn't a very good medium with which to raise money for news on the center. Um, the, the, yes, we see a lot of negative articles about waste and corruption, but we also see another another trope, which is heroes, white heroes, white saviors, uh, or you know, plucky Burundian farmer lady with you know, happy bunch of bananas kind of um, stuff. So there are there are a number of cheesy and uh, and oversimplistic trends, both on the positive and the negative end of the spectrum, and it's it's a it's a tough. Call, uh, because journalistically you don't really win by getting into the grey areas. It's not terribly popular. I used to work on a website which had, um, which tried to give the balanced view on major controversial issues of the day. 
it was a catastrophe because everybody loves to gravitate to their to their base. You know, they love to they love to you know hate on things or love on things, and they don't particularly want to hear the other side. I think in this my first point of of an un, unhealthy media environment, your one of your problems is the silver bullet story. Um, so as well as the saints and the sinners, uh, the other trope that we see frequently is the silver bullet. And there's a, there's a thirst for those. Uh, some of it is a kind of respectable, healthy thirst. In, in the journalistic world, they call it solutions journalism, which is everything in all boom and gloom, and maybe it might be worth trying to see uh, and, and talk to things that are more positive. But I think the cash coverage, uh, the silver bullet thing, only gets you so far, and I think it's quite a risky uh, train to jump on. And, and we've seen it um, a number of times, you know, special superfoods that will solve childhood vitamin deficiency. You can just drink them with their bread and everything is fine, or the straws that they put in the shitty river, and somehow the water becomes magically, you know, transparent at the top end of this plastic device. This stuff is, I think, probably unhelpful. Uh, to the broader agenda of um, greater public understanding yeah. of what you're trying to do. Secondly, the climate of uh, human, in which humanitarian action is happening is changing. I think, uh, I think the media negativity is always going to go away. And frankly, if you were in politics or banking or sports, you would not be sitting there going, nobody has ever mean to us. Everybody gets negative coverage because that's a proper check and balance in, in, in society. And if anything, quite honestly, I think the aid sector gets paid without very much at all. And your press releases and your Christmas appeals and your blog posts and cheesy photographs get out there without very much questioning. So I, 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 I would push back on the idea that you are exceptionally given a hard time by the media. I do think there's a problem at the moment with fatigue um, in a way that perhaps wasn't there before. I think Syria is an example of something where you know you can literally see heading from YouTube, and it doesn't make any it doesn't make any impact. When I was a teenager, there was a thing about snuff killings, right? There was a thing that there were videos going around the world that you could actually see people being killed, and wasn't this amazingly sick and outrageously weird? Now you can you can get it daily, you know, daily from the front lines in Syria, not even the front lines, the back behind the front lines, and it's it. So I think there's not only team um, as inurement to, to suffering. Added to which, you have this um, hyper um, fear mongering about terrorism and extremism, which led to this unhappy climate sanction count. We did a story about northeast Syria where Diffid got collie wobbles because um, the ISIS family had released from Baghouz. Then it thought Daily Mail would give them a hard time, so they stopped the program in northeast Syria. Cause of the fear of Daily Mail is, and I think certainly in the British context, that has now become uh, dangerously uh, prominent. In the, in, um, we can't even get a comment from Diffid on the nexus, for heaven's sake, let alone, uh, let alone counter-terrorism finance and okay. capital. So and the EU is trying to be, I think, slightly more progressive, but the US aid is going on some dangerous as you know, recently in Nigeria, where the where the Mercy Corps driver was picked up with ninety four thousand dollars in cash. Now, was that because he was doing something wrong, or was he doing his job? But as you can imagine, that was pretty easy to turn into COVID in the media, and I'm not sure the agency did a good job of of um, Finally, the vested interests of which you have to admit you're a part. Um, we know that we know that the media. Uh, is, is, is quite easily seduced with stories of success and, and upliftment, but your own institutional baggage and, um, and frankly, uh, long history, you carry it with you, and I think some of the debates today, when we hear, as me and my colleagues listen to these debates, I'll give you an example of localization for many of the international NGOs, they, they want to address it as a technocratic conversation, and the donors want to as a, as a post efficiency conversation, whereas many of your partners in the field wish you could partner some understanding. It's a post colonial conversation. It's about decolonizing 
the aid sector. It's not about efficiency. It's not about technical skill transfer. Mm -hmm. So bear in mind those 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 three uh, areas. Now I'm going to give you three traps that I think you may fall in. I'm nearly finished, but I'll be quick. Number one, it's not that interesting. It's really not that interesting. Cash-based aid is really boring. <laughs> It's like pension. Can you imagine anything more boring than pension? If you do it well, there's not much of a story about the mechanism of the egg. The story is about the people, and it's not either. There's not much of a story about you. Certainly not when it gets to the transfer of value. I think the needs identification is a stronger story, and how you how you graduate out of need and how you get properly caught, you catch the people so they don't fall through the through the gaps. That story is interesting. Sending money is not. I and mean, there was a famous book about disaster insurance called book Belt Disasters. And I think you might also want to think about um, I can't think of the alliteration right now, but um, uh, boring money. Secondly, I think a trap that you you risk falling into is hubris. Uh, you are overestimate your own capacities. You are not going to write banking quality software with a bunch of one-year contract, underpaid, non-profit, in a basement in Camberwell. You're just not. And if you look at the, your bigger um, colleagues, World Food Program has just decided to spend 10 or 20 million dollars fixing their crappy software, excuse me, their um, software which has been shown by an internal audit to have problems. This stuff is really hard. It's really, really hard. And I don't think you should be in the software business, and I don't think you should be in the financial transfer business, and I don't think you should be in the mobile money technology space. Where it's your strength, and I think it's a very difficult discussion, and it involves existential, um, as you will know, existential reflections on your role. But don't try to be what you can't be. And would you put your money in the World Vision software? Your, your family's savings and your granny's house, I'm not sure you would. I think you'd prefer a big grown up financial institution to hold that. So make space for the experts and the defining book. And finally, I think uh, this really is finally the third track, I think, is, is what are you? Are you social welfare ministries? Are you behavioral economists? Are you social market? Social Democrat influences, are you, are you overselling the potential of cash? And, and I think this is a genuine problem, and I, I think this is where you should spend some effort in your media outreach, is that I think there are many different stories for different markets, even more than in the regular media outreach. You know, so, if directly has this uh, massive piece in Vox recently saying about a recent study about how the program is evaluated. It's, it's pitched as a kind of easy to read thing, but it rapidly gets pretty complicated. And I, I, read, I read it on speed, thinking, thank God I'm not um, a development economist. That, is, that does have a legitimate audience, but it's not going to play for, for even the mid-market newspapers. Um, but I think there is, there is a bit of, and, and I think overselling also involves um, Bell's so I spent 45 minutes on the phone with an international aid agency last week about a new uh, cash um, concept, the, the community currencies concept. It's really, really complicated. Plus, you know, it's got added blockchain um, glitter. Um, this stuff is hard to con convey, but it is exciting. And I think you've got nerd audience, and you've got an economist audience, and you've got a, um, a popular audience, and all of them you need to treat differently. So that's the third trap to, to avoid, is to give them that And that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, some very provocative thoughts there from Ben. And I think, speaking to what we've been saying earlier about this idea that we can't get the message right if we don't ask ourselves some quite serious existential questions about what it is that we're actually doing and the role that we play, um, which leads me on to our final speaker and I'm really pleased that Rachel could be here with us today. Um, I think that uh, Rachel can give us a slightly different perspective with uh, Give Directly being a newer organisation operating in this space um, and operating um, under slightly different rules perhaps than 
than some other organizations represented here. Um, and so my question to you, Rachel, is, as we've just discussed, aid organizations are uh, sometimes characterized as ineffectual or out of date, but Give Directly has had quite a lot of success with the media and is often portrayed differently um, as an innovative organization, um, almost kind of part of this tech startup kind of bubble. Um, and so what do you think we could learn from that? How have you approached your work uh, with the media and what do you think other actors here could learn from that? Brilliant, thank you. Um, and thanks for inviting us to join this panel. It's, it's great to be here. I think a lot of what um, Kirsten has said and what, what Ben ha has already spoken to touches on a lot of, about what I will say uh, now as well. I wanted to take a, a, a quick step back and sort of set the scene. I don't know how well people in the room know Give Directly, um, but as Tegan said, we are relatively a new organization in this space. We started in 2008 as an organization that um, at that point we gave $10,000 to an IDP camp in Kenya. Um, and since then have grown, we've, we've scaled quite quickly. We, last year we committed about $60 million in cash transfers. So we've scaled really quickly. However, we're still relatively quite a small player in this space. And, and that scaling, at least initially, was off the back of support from some quite kind of interesting partners. So we were backed from the off from, by um, Google.org and Good Ventures. So already, like, you know, there's, there's, there's something that we've got there that's different, I think, to, to other players. Um, we're also, we're unique, I think, in that we are exclusively focused on cash transfers. So that's all we do. We deliver unconditional cash transfers. We don't do any technical assistance. We don't do any capacity building. We don't do any advocacy. It's purely unconditional cash transfers. And we, um, uh, and we deliver those through mobile money. And we have a focus on um, techno technology to maximize our efficiency and, and effectiveness. Um, there's also another... One of our key objectives is trying to um, build the evidence base around cash transfers. And we don't do that internally, but we do partner with um, independent academics or independent research firms to do evaluations on our programs. And we've got, um, there are 13 of those that have either been completed or are ongoing on Give Directly programs. And they're more often than not what gets us that hook into, into media, I think. Um, Finally, I think Give Directly from the Off has made an internal and an external commitment to transparency. And we aim to be kind of open and frank about everything that we're doing and be quite kind of transparent around where that's gone really well, but also where that's not gone so well. And I think um, um, uh, people sort of point out, and I think it's true, that actually our funder base allows us probably a bit more wiggle room to be able to do that. Um, I don't know if people have seen our blogs or looked at the media, but for example, we've done a blog on fraud, kind of talking quite openly about where we've encountered fraud across our programming. Um, and we've just in the last month or so done um, a kind of 10 year retrospective looking at, okay, what have we done well and what have we not done well? Where is this, where have we, we really um, messed up on this? So, so, so that's the context. And I think that, um, that kind of, foundation has really informed our approach to the media and the media uptake of Give Directly's work and Give Directly's messaging. So we, we're a relatively new, single-focused organization, and that's um, allowed us to benefit from kind of increased media interest from, from traditional outlets, but also um, I think because of some of our backers, so Google, Good Ventures, crypto, like Silicon Valley funders, um, this focus on mobile money and a focus on technology has allowed us kind of access to, I suppose, a new audience and a new angle um, for cash. Um, however, what I think has been um, really key in our positive media attention has been like the big bets. So the big bets in Give Directly programming. And that's things like the universal basic income trial we're running in Kenya, which is the largest trial to date. It's the largest trial of universal basic income that there's been. Um, a partnership with USAID got a lot of coverage where USAID are um, working with us and other uh, kind of traditional aid providers to sort of benchmark cash against other interventions. Um, and then earlier this year, the other one that I think got 
quite a bit of pickup in the media is a partnership again with Google.org to do um, to kind of pre-position ourselves to respond to U.S. Uh, disasters, and they're the ones really where we've managed to get kind of, you know, the meaty, the meaty positive media attention. Um, there's also some kind of practical approaches that, that, of course, we've employed on that. And I don't know that they're kind of dramatically different from other things that are followed in the room. But we, we have, more, more recently, we've invested, of course, in our growth and communications team. And we've really kind of put a um, emphasized building and cultivating relationships with journalists. And part of that um, has been focusing on... Um, giving journalists first-hand experience of what we do. So we run a series of trips out to the field, and we really kind of treat journalists as core partners in that process, give them that kind of first-hand experience of what we're doing. Um, some of you may have come across, I don't know, uh, GD Live. So we've got, as part of our, on our website, we've got GD Live, which is a kind of rolling, real-time um, unfiltered, unedited unedit stories from recipients. It's recipients talking about what their aspirations are once they've received the cash and then kind of just talking openly about what they've spent it on, how it's impacted their lives. And I think that actually um, has proven to be quite a, a valuable kind of primary source for journalists to, to draw from. Um, then, then finally, and I think this talks to uh, the article that Ben references in Vox. So uh, I think it's uh, really trying to identify the big hooks into broader public debates. And this article, some of you may have seen it. This, um, there's been quite a bit of media attention for, for Give Directly in the last week or two weeks. And it's um, somewhat incredibly around a study that's called the General Equilibrium Study. So to us in this room and to us at Cash Week, this is a really exciting study. There's some really you know, interesting findings in it. But outside of this room... Um, I'll be forgiven for saying it's uh, you know it's quite dense, it's quite it's heavily academic, it's quite a it's quite a specialised piece, and and all all credit to our communications manager in New York. She she I think has been quite successful in sort of hooking this into a, a the the U.S. public debate around UBI, um, and on the back of that we've got Vox, but we have also um, the piece has been covered in some of the more kind of mainstream media as well. So in in the Economist, the Washington Post. Um, uh, NPR, and that's really been kind of because we've successfully managed to hook it into something else that is sort of more exciting. Um, and I think uh, we, we've already touched on, of course, the risks around cash programming and talking about this in the media. Um, and Tegan, you mentioned this kind of this susceptibility to accusations of misappropriation or that cash is somehow going to those undeserving or irresponsible and 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 very conscious of that and honestly I think um, as give directly as a as a US focused organization not heavily funded by DFID I think that we have sort of managed to escape perhaps some of the level of scrutiny scrutiny that other uh, organisations um, uh, more focused in the UK have come under. Certain UK media outlets, we all know, we're not under the scrutiny of those. However, it's not to say that there isn't a sort of similar, um, I don't know, anti-aid anti narrative that's going on in the US. And, and, and how we've been approaching that is, is really trying to lead with the evidence. So our media hooks are our links to the media tend to be from third-party research, so really leading with the evidence and the data around that. Um, we've also um, we've had this sta staunch commitment from the off to transparency, and we've been really vocal about this. And we might not sort of hit the mark on this 100% of the time. You know, some, some of this puts us up, I think, to, to, to criticism. We talk about, I mentioned we talk about fraud, um, what's going well, where we can improve, and sometimes this can backfire. But we've kind of, we, we've had from the off quite a staunch commitment to that. Um, this also, uh, sort of talking cautiously and, and heeding what Ben said about not wanting to present cash as a silver bullet, but there is um, th there is potential to kind of position cash program programming as a as part of the antidote to this anti aid narrative. You know, there is a, a, a huge evidence base on cash, as we know. Um, we have a, it's it's highly traceable. We have an ability to be highly transparent, 
um, a, a, in a world of kind of increasingly constrained resources and the kind of debates that we're facing, um, cash programming can kind of be a, a logical choice in that. So, I mean, I think there's a lot more that we can, we can all do around this to sort of make the case uh, for cash, and it no doubt necessitates a really nuanced approach between different media outlets or different geographies or for different organisations. Um, however, through kind of focusing on really leading with the evidence, focusing on the efficiency, we can hopefully kind of, one, tell some positive stories around aid, which are, which are much in need at the moment, and kind of stoke a positive debate around aid effectiveness, and while recognizing cash isn't a silver bullet, kind of having an open conversation about the role that cash programming can, can play in that. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of the speakers. Um, so we've got some time now for questions. Um, hopefully that's provoked lots of thoughts and uh, you've got lots of questions for our panelists. So over to you guys. Okay. Hi, uh, Haroon from Islamic Relief. Um, two questions, actually. Um, one is more of a comment. Um, a lot of the focus has been on the English-speaking media, uh, UK and US especially. H how do you see the role of the, the media, let's say, from developing countries, um, or even French-speaking or Spanish-speaking countries, uh, in terms of engagement with them? And my second question is more around um, what, what I see is more of a, the death of the traditional media in these countries and there's a lot more focus over the last, I would say, four or five years on uh, the rise in social media, especially around podcasts and uh, YouTube. So, for example, someone like uh, Joe Rogan has like 100 million downloads uh, on his podcast every month uh, and that is not your traditional like you know, quick fire, five minutes, that's like one hour, two hours, three hours discussions. So is there, is, is this an area where maybe humanitarians should start getting more into, into these kind of longer discussions and maybe shaping public perception uh, by, by actually going into this direction? Uh, any other questions? We can take a couple and then we can respond. Okay, in that case, um, this is a conversation that Kirsten and I have actually had this idea of, um, yeah, decentralizing how we talk about the media and how we think about the media. Um, so I'd like to invite Kirsten's comments on that one. And then uh, thinking about different forms of media and uh, potentially our role there, perhaps that's one that Ben could answer. Great, thank you. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think I'm gonna hit both in Ben, apologies. So please jump in. Uh, I think I'll probably hit both questions slightly in my response. It is different and we do need to look at who the audience is, what we're trying to achieve and how we're trying to assay it, right? And what understanding what the outlets are trying to achieve, again, who they speak to, and what your, how your message can cut through is really important. Developing media or developing markets de is consuming news in a completely different way. So if you look at Kenya, for instance, it is a lot of it is social media, and actually it has to be verified from multiple sources, is especially with can, um, you can have a traditional news story, but then they feel that most of that is owned, so then it has to be substantiated by people you trust on social media. So the idea of getting news and amplifying messaging through people and voices that are trusted by beneficiaries, by communities, by the public, really resonates. It resonates across all markets, but it's working tremendously well in markets where English-speaking media doesn't lead, or there hasn't always been an inherent trust in media. Um, the Edelman Trust Barometer that comes out every year looks at the trust in media as one of its sectors, and you're seeing an increasing uh, decrease or diminishing levels of trust from the public in the media sector across most countries other than those that may have publicly owned media. For, for instance, you saw an increase of media in trust in media in Russia and China last year, as well as in Saudi Arabia, but actually a decrease in 
the trust of media across most developing countries. So we do need to, as a sector, we absolutely need to be more strategic about where we place our messages, who we speak to, and what we're trying to get out of them. Um, I often talk about it is very common, especially as a PR professional. I grew up in the agency world. I worked on Mercedes-Benz and Kraft peanut butter for a while. Really thrilling. Um, <laughs> but one of the things we were always told to do is spray and pray. And that is literally like, here's a story, and I'm going to send it to everybody and hope that somebody picks it up. And I've seen it happen time and time again, despite what the product is, what the service is, what the client is, and it doesn't work, right? All of us are guilty of it sometimes, because honestly, sometimes it's just by need of sheer efficiency and timing, but it's really, really ineffective. It wrecks your own brand and reputation, and it really impacts when we're looking at languages and uh, media that may be presenting stories in a different way, if that makes sense. Um, and then to pick up on your point about uh, new forms of digital media, I think um, obviously it has completely changed the way that humanitarian organizations can communicate with the outside world, you know, in the countries where they operate and fundraise. But I think that uh, events of the last couple of years have shown us the influence that traditional media still has. So, um, Ben, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, we, I should have prefaced what I said. I'm speaking really from the point of view of online media, and we, we are a niche provider, we're a specialist provider, but we try and speak intelligible to the you know, kitchen table interested liberal international kind of person, whether they be uh, from the north or the south of the world. Um, I, so I, I'm, I'm not, I don't think I have anything particularly interesting to say about non-English media. I, I speak to my experience both from being the gamekeeper and the poacher. Um, yes, I get a lot of really pathetic um, pitches from, from English and dismal press releases. Most of which are dismal because they foreground yourselves. This is this is the number one sin. Save, let's not name names. Uh, my NGO supported hospital in Syria was bombed. I don't care that you sent it a few bandages. It's the most outrageous foregrounding of your own self in front of other people's um, suffering. So I would say number one sins haven't changed much in the new media. They are often that you're talking about yourselves and you're not actually telling a good story. As the person says, you don't want to, don't just send it randomly. Um, and I think the other opportunity which journalists don't like to admit is that you can cut us out if you're clever and you invest. You can have your own podcast. You don't need to persuade some editor to run a story about your thing. You could make it good on your own. And I think has Cal got a truly wonky cash podcast by any chance? Um, of course. Have, right? <laughs> um, sign out now, people. Uh, well, it's still cool. Um, great plug. So yeah, I would say uh, I would say the the promise of the internet was disintermediation that you could get past the media gatekeepers to your audiences, and I think that still is that still is the goal in a certain way. If I can, if you, if if you directly can reach, you know let's say 1,500 influencers and billionaires and, and public, public policy analysts, maybe it doesn't need the other 15,000, you know, or even the other 150,000 that you might get by going through a larger media. So it depends what you want. And I would say, um, yeah, I would say talk to your audience and don't suck up, don't spend too much time sucking up to journalists. Sorry, apologies. One other thought about podcast is um, I think also this sector has a habit of being an echo chamber. We speak to ourselves very, very regularly, and we are already the converted, right? So there's an opportunity with new mediums to take our messages and our stories to a wider public if we determine that that is the right thing you need to do with your desired outcome for that specific project. That was my long-winded caveat. Apologies. But to the point of Joe Rogan or how they built this, or, um, oh God, you could keep going on and on about all these podcasts, um, the high-low. There are tons, 
learn how to fail with Elizabeth Day or how to fail with Elizabeth Day. I could go on and on about ones that have a huge listenership that actually could potentially be really interesting hooks to the conversations we're having and you've already reached a much wider and already engaged audience. They trust the people who are presenting these podcasts and therefore if you bring your ideas to that table, to that medium, you've reached someone new, you're very likely going to be challenged on making it incredibly easy to hear and digest for that audience because that's what they expect and it has a potential to maybe change and influence behaviors, minds, and opinions on the type of work we do. It won't always work, but I think we'd be really, really, it's another um, of our own challenges and or it would be a failing of this sector to forget that these new mediums are popping up and to completely let them pass us. Yeah, and I think um, we, we talk a lot, We've talked a lot this week and in recent years about how the case for cash has already been made. And I think that that is correct within these circles that you talk about, so amongst ourselves. Um, but I think that something that Give Directly does, for example, is that it doesn't assume that that case has been made with external audiences. Um, and so invests a lot of time in telling that story um, that we feel we don't need to necessarily talk about anymore. So is there anything that you wanted to add there? I, I suppose, not really, just to kind of agree and say, yeah, yeah, of course, this is a kind of active part of, of Give Directly strategy. I mean, the other thing that, that we are, are lucky enough to kind of be, be tapped into is this effective altruism um, movement and Give Well and, and these folks. And, and to talk, um, to go to the question on um, English speaking media and, and um, uh, sort of uh, moving into different markets, we rely quite heavily on a lot of that that network to kind of get us into the, the Dutch press or the German press. I mean, it's still fairly, we, there's a lot more we could do on there. I think, you know, from our point of view, this is a, this is a resourcing issue where we're increasingly trying to get into non-English speaking markets and, and we do get picked up there, but largely at the moment as a result of those ex existing networks that tend to be, um, you know, non-traditional groups, I suppose. Um, so, so, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Um, Catherine? Thank you, Catherine Titch from World Vision. Um, I do think one of the things we've talked about this week as well was how can the local actors and the affected community themselves actually push out messages and organize themselves and actually use media and in particular obviously social media um, to even fundraise for themselves. Kenyans for Kenya, some years ago, was one of the very successful mobile money mobilization after a natural disaster had hit uh, many very vulnerable populations. And we know there's a big group in every of these, let's say, vulnerable contexts where you have people that can do fundraising, that can do transfers. So I do think we need to look at media from a very different perspective. How are we helping and empowering communities to bring their message out? And they don't need necessarily us as intermediators. Hi, uh, I'm Barney from the DC. Uh, I just wondered if anyone, uh, particularly Rachel or, or maybe Ben, had any insight into the effective language around cash um, and that goes down well with the public. Because we did some research at the DC a while ago which found that people didn't really understand the word cash and they kind of thought, oh, are you going to march me to a cash machine? Mm. Sorry to say that at Cash Week, but... <laughs> <laughs> so controversial. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, uh, Catherine, to your point, that's, it is a really interesting perspective on communications when you think about the core idea behind cash and this idea of relinquishing control. And if we could actually model that behaviour in communications, what would that look like? And there are some organisations that are doing that already. Um, Kirsten, do you have any thoughts on that first question? Um, sure. So I think it, 100% in the way of actually the most powerful stories are the stories from the beneficiaries themselves. And the more we sanitize them by trying to take them and own them and build them up or change that, shift that narrative to be ours, it's not as effective. Now I also understand the need to do it for our own brand reputation and kind of 
the brand asset itself. However, I think that there is a huge appetite in by these communities. They're already heavily adapted to using social media tools. They might be different than the ones that we currently use in certain Western markets, but we should help to build capacity, help them to understand how they use it, how they tell those messages, and to make sure that they're safe in doing so. Um, so making sure that the communities and those working with them have, understand the safeguards necessary for telling their stories and what that means so that we never put any of our beneficiaries at risk. But I think it's absolutely the right thing to do to help them amplify their voice. And there are more and more agencies that are looking at doing capacity building for free for um, beneficiary groups so that they can amplify their messages. And there's a few actually that um, DFATD in Canada has funded to do that in, t in humanitarian situations, which would be really, really interesting. We'll see how effective it is in the next one because it's just started, but it's a really, really positive idea. And I do think um, it will be beneficial to any brand who is seen as helping beneficiaries and communities speak for themselves and to amplify their messages in an effective, safe, and um, impactful manner. And then uh, to Barney's point around messaging, maybe Rachel, if you want to yeah. start off and then Ben can reflect on yeah. how effective he thinks it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just to loop back on that point, actually, I, do, I, I, think, I think that's super interesting. I think that it's something that we should think about a lot more and, and do a lot more. And I, I mean, what we are doing, I mentioned the GD Live stuff, which is unfiltered and, and uh, uh, the recipient, but we don't, at the moment, we don't do much with it. It's there on our website. You can see it, it's rolling, it's, it's real time. Um, I think it's really interesting to, to think about actually how we can, um, we can kind of do more with that and sort of empowering uh, recipients to tell their own stories. Um, in terms of the language, I think um, there's also something around what we mean when we say cash. Like when, even even within the, even within this room, cash is all kinds of different things: CVA and unrestricted cash and conditional cash and vouchers and all of all of this type of stuff, mobile money. Or um, so I think it's inherently um, really complex. I think again, give directly because we do unconditional cash, cash transfers the vast majority of the time through mobile money. We got a slightly simpler story to to tell there. I suppose it's, it doesn't have to be quite as nuanced. In terms of the the language that, that we find gets gets most pick up. I mean, we we talk obviously we talk about the universal basic income pilot is a slightly different thing. We talk about mobile money transfers. We talk about cash grants, um, and I think try sort of as far as we can to make that very explicit about what what we're talking about. I think probably mobile money mobile money transfers is um, is, is our kind of default. I think Ben has probably got greater insights around what, what, what gets picked up better or not, but, but that's, I think we have a slightly simpler story to tell from the first place. Um, unconditional, no strings attached cash. I think, you know, we would use that rather than unconditional, but um, yeah. Yeah, I think um, it, it's something that's come up a few times this week, this idea of language and definitions and being clear what we mean when we say things. And CALP has adopted the term cash and voucher assistance, which we purposefully did because previously we were using the phrase cash transfer programming and that was not entirely correct. Um, you know, we're not just talking about programming, uh, we're talking about the use of cash and vouchers in all cases. Um, and so as an umbrella term, that was the one that the technical advisory group agreed would be kind of like the best catch-all phrase and it's a mouthful and the acronym CVA is questionable, you know, how... how, how um, memorable that is or, or how people whether people actually know what we're talking about when we use it so um yeah ben what are your thoughts on on language and and what how that resonates with uh, perhaps the less informed uh, public yeah i mean my my job at the new humanitarian is, is frequently to write about policy things so i'm already in a sort of uh, if any of you i'm in a sort of cockney translator situation trying to make this stuff um, mean anything to anybody else and I don't like cash and I've tried to stop using it um, I think it sounds odd I think I think um, allowances works um, and and to be honest maybe depending on your the country you come from social security or welfare payments are also relevant analogies you know, when I was a student I got housing benefit uh, 
and that's a cash. That was a ca that was a condition. I guess a conditional cash valve transfer assistance programming modality. Um, <laughs> also, I got the doll. Um, uh, back, in, back in those in the good days. Um, so yeah, I, I think it, I think it's I think these terms depend a lot on your national vocabulary, and therefore, as us as an internationally based English language product. We've switched it around a bit, um, but yeah, I think welfare, social security. I think grants is good, but then we use grants a lot because we're referring to donors giving money to NGOs. So we tend to use that word over there, and it'll be hard for us maybe to use it down at the, at the sort of nano scale. Um, on, on, on the previous question, I think uh, a previous point about unfiltered, I'm going to challenge you, um, I'm afraid, Rachel. How is it that nobody in your project ever makes a spelling mistake and their English grammar is always perfect? Uh, thanks. Um, I, I think they do. I think they do. Um, I mean, I, I quite often do this. If you go on GD Live, um, I can say this quite openly to this audience. Um, search for alcohol and it will come up. Not, not loads, but it will come up. Or search for, I don't know, Less the, the less usual things that people spend their cash transfers on. Search for second wife or, you know, tobacco. Or all of these things will, will come there. They are genuinely, they're typed in by our call centre. So our call centre will do follow-up calls with every recipient. The ones that give consent, I, I must say, um, their stories are typed up by our call centre um, call centre staff and they're fed unedited onto onto GD Live. So maybe that explains some of the, the, the English you might see, but they are they are genuinely unedited and un, unfiltered. Yeah, find the find the most sort of the worst use of cash transfers you can on there. There are there are things that come up. Yes. <laughs> oh no, please don't. <laughs> You've uh, just given me a story idea. Actually. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question at the back there. <clears throat> I'm not sure quite what um, to describe as the potential time frame for this, but it seems um, like a lot of humanitarian leadership has become quite preoccupied with the optics of what they do. Um, to the point where you've had massive investment and growth in organizations of communications departments and uh, very, very often those communications departments become very influential over the uh, operations of that uh, institution. Um, to the point where also they're listening very much to what um, donors are saying and being heavily influenced to do things in a certain way that perhaps is more simplistic um, but possibly less relevant or useful in, in terms of impacts. Um, <clears throat> acknowledging the, the benefits and the, 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 the opportunities that there are in good engagement with media, should we also try uh, and hold a bit more of a line, which I would describe as kind of authentic uh, impact-based pro programming, and push back against a lot of the uh, advice to oversimplify, to, to worry about the optics of what we do too much, because in, in very real terms, from a, a, a front looking uh, uh, organizational point of view, um, the type of work that we do related to cash and voucher assistance, but other parts of assistance as well, is much more complicated than a soundbite. Oh, is there a question in the middle there? Uh, should I come to Will first and then I'll work my way to the front? I just wanted to kind of push back on the idea that, you know, aid agencies shouldn't be developing software. Um, there's, there's a huge gap, you know, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done that is not being filled by traditional financial industries. And, you know, uh, whether or not I would put my grandmother's, you know, savings into a, you know, glittery blockchain product, yeah, maybe not right now, but like, that that's a it's it's a long trajectory and you know if we want to sort of develop financial infrastructure then there's there's a lot to do there and it, it, to kill it before it's <clears throat> even started is a little bit like throwing out the baby with the bathwater
Hi, I'm Karen and I'm with CALP. And I was wondering, Rachel, if you could elaborate a bit on how GiveDirectly more recently invested in the growth of their comms team and um, kind of how that went about. Because I think, um, I think that's something that's incredibly important in the effectiveness of the products that we are disseminating and um, just being well equipped as staff to be able to do so. And that's something that's not um, easy to get buy-in sometime internally as well. So we have a, the first question about whether, whether we should invest in comms and then uh, the second on how to do it. Um, so to um, your first question, sorry, I didn't catch the gentleman's name at the back. Jonathan. Jonathan. Um, your question was around uh, this tension between um, wanting to tell the story externally and communicating the complexity of what it is that we do. Um, so I wonder, Kirsten, do you have any reflections on that? Um, yeah, I'm happy to. And I will admit I'm going to uh, wave the flag of there needs to be a strong comms team. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Having run one, I can absolutely understand that it feels like they can become very large and influential. And um, often from being inside one that has probably been called that, it... it oh. Oh, it doesn't feel that way. Um, it feels more like Karen's side of there's not, there's so many, the demands on the people within those teams and then the resources actually to deliver them is often that it's a, it's a real tension. And you often, you really, really feel it. I'm sure your colleagues within the comms teams would agree. Um, I think the idea and coming to your point of should we be less focused on the optics and more focused on impact program, I think they go hand in hand. And if we don't have, the problem is the public, the donors, regulators are becoming not necessarily more focused on optics. They're heavily focused on delivery outputs, impact and delivering on promises and expectations. And if we can't tell that story in a way that they fully understand it um, or that they're going to Im help. So if the public is influencing, say, the policymakers, the public have to understand the problem. Right, and they have to understand the way that you are the solution to the problem. And you do need a comms team to do it. I have absolutely been in a number of conversations that are, that's, over, that's oversimplified. Well, that's actually how it's going to be digestible. So it's a real struggle and it, sometimes it has to land. There's a balance, right? It isn't always the mum test um, that if your mother can explain what you've just told her, it's right. And it isn't always the most technical argument. It, there is a happy middle and again, my biggest, guide and steer on that would, from a comms perspective is always to think about who the ultimate audience is. So what is their level of understanding? What are you trying to get from them? So how much are you trying to consult them, inform them, or influence them? How much information do they currently already have about the context? How much information do they, current, do they need to really understand it to do, to get them where you're trying to get to them? Don't ever Infocoms is where I think we get, oh, and I shouldn't use that term because it can be very technical within organizations. Push comms is the best way I can use it. Information that we're just sending out to send out for what I hate of a checkbox. Basically like, oh, I sent out that information. I sent out that email, done, it's done. That is the type of information that therefore gets too diluted and doesn't justify or build the brand and the reputation. If you are looking towards knowing that granny is the one you're ne needing to send this message to, it probably does need to be diluted slightly or simplified. If you're actually sending it to a policymaker who should have a strong context and understanding of the situation, you should use the technical language. So again, it's not a one size all fits all approach. It has to be very tailored, targeted, and you do need a comms team in-house who understands those needs and understands the audiences to help to build that. Thank you. Um, and then picking up on uh, what Will's comment there around whether uh, humanitarian organizations should be investing in creating software, I think it speaks to an issue that's uh, come up a couple of times this week around um, specialization versus, you know, trying to do a bit of everything and whether, you know, the funding structures that we have at the moment actually incentivize um, specialization. Um, and I think it was agreed here that, that often they don't. Um, whereas, as Rachel spoke to earlier, Give Directly doesn't have such an issue with that. Um, it, it is a single focused organization and therefore communications around that are quite simple. Um, 
or simpler, shall we say. Um, so I wonder whether you wanted to pick up on both Will's point and then Karen's. Um, yes, I don't know that I've got, I've got loads to, to Will's point, to be honest, but, and, and to pick up on, <laughs> on Karen's, I, I know that our communications manager is following this on the live stream, so she'll be, she'll be chuckling away because she is, she is our only communications manager. I don't want to... She's, she's going to be having words with you. <laughs> I don't want to give the impression we've got this sort of huge communications team working around the clock. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but we, we, we have invested. We have, a, we have a growth team, so that's sort of you know, all of our kind of... Um, our, our website, our re retail, our public funding, that type of, of five people. Um, but we have, um, and, and these are fairly recent hires, so in, probably in the last 18 months, two years. Um, and we've recently had a dedicated communications so media lead um, who is tasked with kind of cultivating and building those relationships. So, um, I mean, there has been a recognition within Give Directly that this is um, important for us. It's really critical to build um, capacity around this. Uh, we haven't got a, a 20 person comms team, so I'm not going to tell you that. Yeah. Yes, it's a, it's, it, it's a tension, I think, that exists in all humanitarian organisations, um, and it's good to know that it, <laughs> it's something that you are familiar with as well. Um, are there any other questions? Haroon? It's a question more for Ben, um, reflecting on his original uh, presentation. Um, regarding the, the concept of white saviors and how they're presented in the Western media, I mean, from my uh, like viewpoint, in, in the, our sector, we don't really do this. Uh, and maybe it is in the media, but maybe that's more from like celebrities or, I don't know, politicians or something. But it just it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on how prevalent this is from within our sector and what actually can we do about it if that is what the public is looking for? Hi, I'm uh, Nicola from the Disasters Emergency Committee, as well as Barney here. Um, so I wanted to ask about um, picking up the comment from the back that was made earlier as well. So, you know, we work very closely with media partners and, you know, we'd love to be able to present this work more. But I, I do have to say that some of the organisations that we do have good links with, such as ITV, don't have time for a complicated story. And really, they still want a visual story. They, they still ask me for some aid dropping out of a plane and that kind of thing, and where are the doctors being flown in. So, you know, while there are more sophisticated parts of the way the story is told, they just don't have the space either. And they're very honest about that. It's not that they don't care, even they care about our sector and can help, you know, deliver a whole appeal for a humanitarian um, disaster through their coverage. So, it, so it's not that we're not even having the conversations, but I think there is that side about the visual representation of cash transfers. And if somebody, I took Ben's, I think it was what Ben was saying earlier, that you, it is about showing the beneficiary and the beneficiary talking about how they've been able to use the money. But when you're working with a mainstream media that wants a visual representation of that, I would love to hear some people, see some examples, because we would very much like to replicate that, because more and more of DECPL money is going to cash work, but we'd love to see those examples. Yeah, I think um, two points that are actually linked. So is, is cash and voucher assistance actually helping this sector move away from this kind of like white savior trope? And how can we kind of like more effectively communicate this to a more kind of public audience? So any thoughts on that, Ben? Yes, um, yeah, I, I, I fully accept that the, the white saviour thing has become a bit of a, a, sort of a parody of, a, of itself uh, in that it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a visual or a narrative that the that mainstream endured these days very much, although you will see it in Christmas is coming um, and you'll see some, uh, some nurses in tough locations, I suspect. Um, so I, 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 I think my point really was that, that it is a lazy media uh, story more than a lazy NGO communication story that, that is hard to squash. 
and I'm not sure it will ever be squashed. If it's the plucky nurse from Cork, you know, in, 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 in the Irish media, you just cannot really beat that um, for, for some types of media. And the same with the ITV, it's, it's um, the, the things coming out of the plane is just a great image, it's moving pictures. I'm sorry that, you know, the person with the hoe and the, and the carrots is just not quite as cool. Um, but this also speaks to the point about earlier, from the earlier round of questions about the infantilization. And I think uh, I, it drives me nuts for that, you know, um, both aid agencies and donors get away with oversimplification and lying. Um, and, and about how their projects are super successful, and they never have any money go to fraud, and I think it goes brilliantly. Um, it, it drives me nuts, but to be honest, it works. You know, uh, and, and it's it's quite rare that you see either the donor or the agency held to account on their claims of efficiency, success, and program um, genius. So uh, keep doing it until you trick. And then when you trip, you're going to fall very hard. And I think that's where Diffid is, is treading a dangerous line. If you if you bend over backwards to the Daily Mail, you'll, you'll box yourself in. And you say, no, if we're going to help in, in Yemen, we're going to lose a few quid. What do you think? You know, we're going to lose a few quid in, in Manchester. Why would we not lose a bit more in Yemen? So I, I, I can see both sides of the argument. I think the large, aggressive NGOs and UN agencies probably can get away with just Wanting it, you know, and not acknowledging these nuances, and I think perhaps the smarter, luckier, up and coming ones could make a competitive advantage out of acknowledging that things are complicated. Um, uh, I, I just want to make one overall point listening to this conversation. What are you doing? What are you doing? Are you, are you promoting cash as the way to do aid? I don't know really. I think maybe CALP is. And give directly, perhaps, is because it's 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 kind of its action is a policy sort of laboratory in a sense. It's got a point to make about policy. But for the rest of you, why talk about cash at all? Why? Why is it your mind really talk about vaccines or or, or or fertilizer or something else? And that's where I'm a bit puzzled about this dialogue. Do you feel as NGOs that there is an advantage to talking about cash? I think that that is a diminishing opportunity as it becomes more and more mainstream. Interesting. Any any reflections from the rim on that? Uh, so while I'm holding the mic, so sort of related to what Ben's just said, is to then put it back to the room and say, um, what could CALP as a network be doing either to tell a particular story that members want to tell or um, help with kind of more practical things like sharing if we have a particular visual that's really clear and useful. Um, so not at all to, uh, for anyone to necessarily answer Ben's question, but more to bring it back around to how Oh, could we further um, the communications aims that our members might have? Which I'm sure that Tegan's already spoken about at the beginning, but I wasn't here. <laughs> well, I think, I think it's interesting because we, we sort of, uh, we based this session on the assumption that cash, is, cash and voucher assistance, you know, the, the benefits are known to us all. Um, and it's doing good and it's transforming our sector in a positive way and so therefore it's going to be part of the evolution of humanitarian action in some way whether we like it or not um, and at the moment some organizations are talking about it with greater success than others um, but I mean Ben's, Ben's point is an interesting one you know that doesn't necessarily need to include everyone but those that want to do it need to be thinking about how they bring others on board with them. Uh, thanks. Um, I actually do still, 
I think, Ben, you are a very technical, you are a technical expert. And as you say, the new humanitarian is our go-to for that reason, because you are so specialist. If we look at the wider public or wider media, traditional, social, other or new mediums, and again, the final audience of the public, I actually think cash is still uniquely placed to be presented as a solution to innovation within, especially with the larger, more, <laughs> this is awful within the safety of this room, but archaic beasts of aid, 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 aid agencies, there you go, Kirsten, um, where they aren't necessarily known for doing anything beyond the visual images of dropping aids, foodstuffs, et cetera. And that still matters and that's still fundamental to the programming and to who they are and their ethos of their brand and their offering. But cash is a bit of a new and innovative solution to some of their programming. And it's starting to replace some of their traditional programming. So I think depending on, again, not to harp on that that whistle, is that a thing? Wow. Um, <laughs> to really emphasize the point, that's what I meant, um, of audience desired outcomes and what we're trying to achieve. It's if we're trying to change the message around and the narrative around cash around those who aren't as familiar, I think there is a really unique offering and opportunity there. But to Ben's point, it is becoming more and more regular. So for those who are pluckier or, or innovative, it, there's a real opportunity for us to tell the story properly and for those organizations who are specializing in it to really amplify their brand and to start to own the piece and that narrative a little bit more. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah, I was just going to add briefly, I mean, the, the, it, Give Directly has certainly found this. I mean, I, I don't know if people have seen the, the coverage and stuff. Um, it, we do get media interest and people, um, the outlets do see it as something really innovative. I'm sure, you know, quite often we try and kind of correct the media and sort of say, oh, this, actually this has been happening for, for decades. This isn't, this isn't just us. Um, but it is seen as, as something, um, I think, um, as, a, as a, a, a sort of very effective, positive story to challenge some of the anti-aid mm -hmm. stories that are coming out, you know, in, in, both in the US and the UK. Um, and we are seeing that, and I, and I do think while it may not um, always be the most effective story to shout about, and certainly not to every every different type of media or organisation, there's certainly a role there to um, to lead with the evidence base on cash, to lead with the impact that we that really tangible impact that you can see and you can trace um, with cash programmes, um, and kind of fill that fill that space that, that's left with kind of positive, a positive aid story. And certainly, um, you know, I, ho I hope that Give Directly can c continue to kind of contribute in that, in that space. Thank you. Um, so I'm conscious of the time. We're sort of five minutes from the end now. So I wondered whether um, anyone had any closing thoughts. Um, invite my panellists first if you have any closing thoughts um, and then go to the room. Uh, thank you. So thank you all very much for your time. The last thing I just want to say is I didn't kind of provide in my opening comments or opening remarks ways to get around the risk. So I wanted to leave you with an acronym um, that we often use and it is LAST. So if you want to overcome the scrutiny, the any kind of concern, risk, you want to last. So L is for landscape mapping. I can also share this with Tegan to share with you and also happy to speak to any of you about it if you'd ever like. Landscape mapping is really key, often the sector because of the perception gap and because we're so busy, we don't always look at what is happening around us, but due to that echo chamber. We think about our own internal organizations, we navel gaze, um, I can see a lot of head nodding, so this is familiar um, and that's okay, but we have to look at how our messages are going to resonate with the world and audience around us. So a really good example of where this was missed is the NGOs who had search and rescue operations that started in the Mediterranean during the refugee, European refugee crisis. Um, often, and I was at Save the Children at the time, and I can say that we kind of bounded into the opportunity and really felt that the public was going to respond incredibly positively to the fact that we were saving lives. First and foremost, that's what we were doing. We missed the fact that the public and the narrative around the European refugee crisis was becoming increasingly polarizing and increasingly toxic. And therefore our messages landed quite poorly. We were agile and pivoted, but landscape mapping. 
So that's your first one. A, accountability, um, which has been used many, many times. I couldn't agree with um, both Rachel and Ben more about accountability is key, especially when we're talking about cash. The Gates Foundation do a really good job, actually, of holding themselves account to when things fail. Not all the time, but they release um, a polio, I think it's an annual polio report that talks about how many failings they've had based on financial mismanagement, et cetera. Again, something I can send to you, and I've just misquoted it, I'm sure. But in general, it's, it's a fail report. Engineers Without Borders don't release annual reviews anymore. They release failed reports. And it isn't as open and transparent as you would like it to be, but it really holds themselves to account, therefore to push themselves forward slightly. Um, Ben is absolutely right. This is coming. So we have to, as a sector, be willing to pivot and start to do this in a more transparent way. S is stakeholders, so always understanding your audience. And this could be anyone from a beneficiary to the general public. Who are you talking to? What, do you tr what information do they have? How are you trying to change, inform, consult? know your stakeholders, how you're gonna manage them, and T, transparency. So again, a word that's been used a lot today is unless your messages are clear, direct, transparent, and honest, it's not gonna work. So really, if you want to last, you do landscape ma mapping, accountability, stakeholders, and transparency. Thanks. Go ahead. I think that's, it's pretty hard to follow that, actually. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure, not sure where I wanna go next, but thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, look, they're, they're things that I've, I've spoken about, I think, throughout this session, um, in transparency and accountability, and a kind of, um, uh, a preparedness to kind of engage in an open debate around around these issues of, of aid effectiveness. And I think that there's, um, you know, the, the, there's two objectives around this. One is kind of making the case for cash, but arguably, you know, to some degree that's that's been made. It's still a, you know, a, a, a tiny percentage, as we all know, of, of overall aid spend, but, but the case for cash is there. Um, to, to some degree. But also I think there's a real opportunity for us to use that to create positive stories around effective aid spent that um, based on a, a kind of a fairly unique ability to be transparent and to be accountable and to tell those and to tell those really impactful stories. And I think particularly, um, you know, at, at the moment, um, those positive stories are, are really in need um, and important for us, I think, to try and try and try and fill that gap. Thank you. Um, and so, in two minutes, any closing remarks, Ben? Um, well, s send me stories um, and leak me documents. And, um, tell me the bad and the good. Uh, I mean, we haven't talked about um, the negative side, and I think I think we're overdue for a big uh, digital screw up. Um, which will put some of this data responsibility into sort of real life um, context. I think the most exciting, I think cash is one of the things that many people agree is one of the few things that's going right in the sector. And for that, all of you who have, have lobbied for it should, should enjoy some credit. However, the, the nasty part of this is that the most exciting future of cash is not necessarily the best future for your organization. And I think that these, these where um, Kirsten correctly corrected me, I think, uh, very well, that telling the story about cash is a good story for your organization. And it's a sort of great opportunity to reset, uh, 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 as Rachel said, the, um, you know, some of the negativity. But the really exciting thing about cash is cutting out the middleman, decolonizing, uh, not localizing, but de-internationalizing and having some person-to-person -person solidarity injected back into the operation, which, which is why I like the Give Directly Live, because it's like real people talking to other real people. And things like Kiva have gone off into some weird blockchain uh, land, but the, those examples of P2P um, lending and uh, international solidarity, I think, are, are examples of how things might change now in cash. Thank you. Thank you, um, and thank you to all of you for um, coming and for all of you for being here. Um, I think this is the end of Cash Week, officially. Um, Rose, do you want to do the, 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 final, the final words? Uh, I was uh, just going to say um, thank you ever so much to our final uh, panelists.
panel of Cash Week in London. Um, it's been great. So uh, why don't we give them a round of applause and then I'll tell you about coffee. Um, so uh, do stay for coffee networking. I saw a giant chocolate cake. Apologies for those who are online and can't enjoy it. Um, but thank you, uh, and thank you especially uh, to Ben uh, for dialing in, and thank you uh, to everyone who's been um, running around again and making this happen. I know Karen did a big thank you this morning, um, but thank you again for this afternoon, um, especially to all, everyone who's been helping on AV Bits and Bobs. Um, thank you. This is the end. <laughs> thank you, everyone. <laughs>